All right, we are live with a special back to school question and answer session with Dr. Charles Pascal. Thank you so much for joining us, doctor. Uh, better late than never, Dee. Better late than never. We had a few technical difficulties, but we're here now. Um, I am Dilshad Berman. I am a web writer for City News and 680 News. Dr. Charles Pascal is a professor of applied psychology and human development at the Ontario Institute for, St uh, for Studies in Education. He's also an Order of Canada recipient, and he is the former Deputy Minister of Education for Ontario. So we're very honored to have you here. Um, and we've got a long list of questions coming in from our viewers today. So shall we get started? Uh, let's get to it. Okay, let's get through it. Um, let's start with this one. We've got a question from Varun who asks, my child is four and due to kindergarten and is due to go to kindergarten this September, but I'm still confused what the options are and what to choose. So he's basically asking, what are the factors that parents should consider before opting in for either in-person or online learning? Well, the first thing is to recognize that parents know their kids best. And so with respect to this question, it's, it's really a matter of uh, the child, uh, where she or he is at regarding uh, getting excited about, you know, going, uh, this will be the first kind of in-school experience uh, because it's uh, junior kindergarten. And um, you wanna have a conversation with the, uh, the principal and maybe go on site to look at the most important thing, which is social distancing. Mm -hmm. ensuring that there is plenty of space, two meters or more uh, between desks, and then all the basics regarding the uh, hand washing and those kinds of things are at play. So I think it's, it's about the environment and whether the environment is safe because there are uh, many situations in classrooms around the province that are less than safe because of uh, the lack of resources provided by the provincial government. In other situations, uh, uh, kindergarten teachers and the schools have had the space and the, the ventilated space uh, to, uh, to make a go of it. So a little more information, knowing your child, being optimistic, and staying calm. Most important thing for parents is do everything you can to take care of yourself so that you don't pass on the stress to the kids. Absolutely, yes, that's definitely good advice. We've got a lot of questions regarding that kind of handling of stress. So um, one of them actually comes from our reporter, Mark McAllister in the newsroom. He says, what is your direct message to kids then? What would you say to a young child who is maybe a little bit anxious, maybe a little bit scared uh, about starting school in this environment? Well, kids, uh, you know, independent of the pandemic, there's always uh, differences across, uh, you know, the variety, the diversity of, of our youngest of our young. So again, it's about, um, whether this is unusual uh, you know, anxiety about it or just simply the natural uh, uh, you know, expectations about something new. Again, parents know their kids best. And the notion of if, if you feel based on direct information from the school that a junior kindergarten class, senior kindergarten class, and those from you know, one to three and on up, if you feel that the social distancing has been able to be managed by that particular school. And that's a problem across the province because of the lack of provincial resources. But if the social distancing is there uh, and everything else is in place, uh, you know, pushing the child just a little bit beyond that natural thing. But if, it's, if the anxiety is high, you, you gotta respect that because you don't want to create further issues of stress. Again, how parents have these discussions have to be with as much calm as possible. Absolutely. Um, and then let's go to this one. Brian asks, knowing adolescents' behavior, do you believe that keeping them in high school classrooms for over three hours without removing their masks or getting playful or sleepy will work? Well, it wouldn't work for me. Uh, you know, having a mask on for more than a little while is uh, challenging, uh, but I wouldn't want um, uh, students of any age uh, to be in school that long without breaks. So my suggestion is independent of the weather, let's break it up. Let's go for walks. Let's have walking conversations with social distancing. So let's, let's break that up. But, but Brian raises an important question about the kind of freedom that everything's gonna be fine that we're seeing in younger and younger people who are uh, showing 
showing up in larger percentages regarding you know getting the uh, getting the the virus. So it's all about monitoring and making sure that uh, out in the playground uh, during recess, and I think there should be more recesses uh, that that's monitored, and that people get used to understanding that this is not just about our own health; it's about what we do for others. And for those who who don't get it yet, and there are far too many that don't, think back about when we uh, we got rid of smoking. We didn't get rid of smoking until the science showed uh, that basically secondhand smoke uh, really hurt other people. Right. And we need more and more people in Canada to understand that this is about something larger than, the, than our own particular uh, view of uh, uh, freedom or liberty to do anything we want. Absolutely. Um, and then more questions about younger kids. Um, how do parents prepare the little ones for this new reality in school? What are the kind of um, rules that they might be able to implement or, or you know, properly prepare them to understand what's happening? Well, I mean, on the positive side, we always have to look for silver linings and stay as optimistic as we can. Uh, little kids, uh, you know, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, when I walk around Toronto or Picton, Ontario, uh, I see the youngest of our young are already wearing masks where they should be wearing masks. They seem to be very uh, proud of, of the masks they're wearing. Uh, some of them are kind of homemade, but, uh, but quite safe. So, you know, the notion of, of being around with a mask, the notion of social distancing, a lot of that is already in place. The key, of course, is uh, the use of masks I think should be, you know, mandatory uh, as young as possible. But masks should not be an excuse. When people emphasize that there'll be plenty of masks, that should not be an excuse for social distancing. Right. And when we look at what's required for uh, elementary school kids and kindergarten kids, uh, two meters apart, uh, 15 kids or less, lots of ventilated space, and the kinds of things that with better planning and better leadership provincially, we would have more confidence and fewer parents would be actually keeping their kids away from school uh, rather than understanding that things are already in place. So again, uh, masks, social distancing and, um, and hand washing and all the, the basics. And all these things are gonna have to be monitored, but the, the kids are already used to wearing masks. Uh, I see them everywhere and I see uh, two and three year olds uh, wearing masks. But again, for a long time, wearing masks, uh, very difficult, very difficult for communications. If you and I, D, were having this conversation uh, for 20 minutes with our masks on, uh, one of us would be saying, I'm sorry, sorry, could you repeat that, Charles? Or D, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. So masks as much as possible, but social distancing rules. Right, absolutely. Um, and so you are also an expert on helping daycares prepare um, to, for COVID-19 and for, for returning to, um, to operations. So uh, Janice is asking, she's very concerned about returning to school. Um, how have school, schools prepared and what are all the precautions that they should be taking or are taking in order to keep all our kids safe? Well, it's the same, it's the same kind of thing, but you mentioned in your, in your question, uh, child care. And child care has been, uh, unfortunately, not given a huge amount of attention. Uh, when we want uh, 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 people to go back to work and we want their kids to be in safe environments, uh, what, are, what about before and after school child care? Right. And uh, we haven't done well with respect to the proper investments we need in child care. So mm -hmm. when the federal government offered a couple billion dollars a few weeks ago, I, I would love to have seen that uh, earmarked towards uh, child care, which a federal government has some responsibility for uh, for assisting. But uh, regarding kids of all ages, whether it's in child care centers, uh, it's about ensuring uh, the health and safety, not just of the kids and the students, it's about the health and well-being of our teachers and our caregivers and the mental health of everybody, parents, students, uh, caregivers, and um, uh, child care workers and, uh, and uh, teachers, that has to be part of uh, how we go forward. Not enough attention has been paid to that. Right, absolutely. So let's talk about a little bit about the plans that the province has come up with when it comes to going back to school. There's three different kinds of plans. 
One is all online learning, one is in-person learning, and then there's an adaptive model, which is 50-50. So as an education uh, expert and the former deputy minister of, of education, what are your thoughts on these plans? We can go through them one by one, we can do it all together, but what are your feelings about these plans? Well, let's assume, God forbid, God help Ontario, uh, I was still the deputy minister. And let's pretend that I had a minister that actually listened to me. I would have been having discussions with the minister and the premier three months ago about the only options available. It's as though a few folks at Queen's Park just discovered that there would be three options, you know, maybe two months ago rather than three or four months ago. These are finite options. The amount of time we have lost regarding getting all of these various possibilities in place, including improving what we do in terms of online and remote uh, distance learning and all the other things that need to be in place. So a lot of time and, and has been squandered, but the most important thing that has been squandered, Dee, uh, is uh, the, the wonderful uh, quality of collaboration. And uh, you know, I listen to uh, taxpayer paid ads uh, that tell me that uh, there's been consultation with everybody and that simply is not true. Uh, the lack of collaboration from those at the front line, uh, education experts, people who understand what we might call instructional systems design that can get us the best ways of, of dealing with uh, online learning, uh, which is gonna be a work in progress for several years. Uh, there'll be lots of problems. But in addition to that, it's school boards have been given 37 different changes uh, from the Minister of Education regarding, no, you can choose whatever you want to do, depending on local, check with your public health authorities. Uh, and then, uh, then finally, uh, we want everybody in class. Well, everybody in class, if things were planned well, because there was enough time and cooperation and collaboration, why is it that when the intent is to have all kids in face-to-face -face in school, why is it that 25 to 50% of parents at this point are keeping their kids at home? There seems to be a little uh, unfortunate irony uh, that the planning and support from the province, especially the amount of resources required for hiring more teachers. Now what we are facing, unfortunately, is because more parents are keeping kids out of school because they don't think the planning uh, leadership from the province has been effective, uh, there are uh, teachers actually getting layoff notices. Uh, so this is a unfortunate perfect storm of the wrong kind regarding the need for more teachers, more social distancing, but because of the chaos uh, that's very part of the process, uh, we are where we are. Right, absolutely. Um, so on that note then, um, Brett asks, if you were making the choice, is it better to do virtual school first and see how that pans out or then do in-person school first and then see how that pans out and switch vice versa? Well, there's a lot of conversations. That's a very good question. There's a lot of conversations about what happens um, when there is a, a breakout at this school or that school. Right. Uh, it's probably it's probably going to happen because of all the things that have not taken place. So the best approach to all of this would actually be to do everything possible to decrease the probability that there will ever be a breakout. Uh, so uh, it's just at this point in time, it's. Uh, it's ready, fire, aim. It's we're going to see how it works. Uh, parents will make their decisions, uh, and we're going to learn as we go. And one of the things that I would really like to encourage uh, all parents and all teachers and students to do, in addition to trying to remain calm, there's nothing worse than having somebody who's stressed out have somebody like me say, "Hey, just calm down." Uh, but we have to find ways of of getting to that place of calm, reducing our stress. But one thing we should all be doing is, is taking notes of how it's working or not working. And those notes are really important because that's part of the improvement process. The more we learn as we go, whether you're a student and what's working well, or you're a parent, especially parents with, uh, or teachers, uh, what are the lived experiences that you can share uh, with those leaders at the local level uh, and the province. And those lessons learned, those lived experiences, need to be shared with elected officials uh, who work at the provincial level uh, through direct conversations about 
uh, this isn't working, and here's why it's working in very specific terms. So let's keep track of things that will help us going forward in terms of reimagining uh, education going forward. Right. Um, so Pat asks then, do you think that the public health guidelines are stringent enough and can parents have confidence that the schools will in fact follow through and take all of those precautions? Well, when it comes to public health, I look, um, you know, it depends on what public health experts you're listening to. I have lost confidence in uh, the chief medical officer of health for, for the province who always seems to be lagging behind the curve. He's trying to flatten. So when he endorses one meter of, of distancing for, uh, for elementary school kids, it just, it, it flies in the face of everything we've, we've heard for five and a half months about the importance of social distancing. Uh, so, you know, and local public health authorities, uh, you know, vary with respect to their own capacity. And we need to, we need to listen to epidemiologists, uh, not just the folks who, uh, who have high level of credentials, including myself, uh, who, uh, who offer opinions rather than ideas based on evidence. Right. So on that note, then, Jen actually asks, why are we reopening schools at all? Do you think it's absolutely essential for children to be back in class, in-person learning? What are the benefits of in-person learning that would outweigh these considerations of all the COVID-19 risks? Uh, well, that's a great, that's a great question. And um, again, with respect to the kind of top-down, I know best kind of sense we get from uh, the Minister of Education, um, we we we've known uh, we've known for a long time uh, what the possibilities would be, and people in other jurisdictions were talking about let's get this right, and maybe start postponing uh, postponing uh, the time of of entry. It's only recently, based on what BC did to just delay a week, and the pressure from the bottom up, great educators, great directors of education, and school boards and teachers and parents saying, shouldn't we open when we're ready? And it's only that bottom up pressure and maybe some polling uh, results or focus group uh, reports are coming to the, uh, the premier that all of a sudden, uh, you know, the, the minister hops on board and saying, yeah, we could have some delayed entries. It just has taken so much time to understand, let's open when we are ready. I started advocating based on the fact that uh, things were in such bad shape in terms of the lack of provincial leadership and resources, I suggested that we open uh, October 1st or October 15th. Let's get this right. Let's take a page from, from Denmark where uh, they, they've been open safely uh, for, for a number of months uh, with, with groups of 12 kids uh, that are basically part of their own bubble with one teacher with extra uh, 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 curriculum materials uh, brought in to help. Right. Uh, and uh, it's working beautifully. And so, yes, delaying uh, to get it right is great. Again, I join with the premier and the minister and others who say it's great for kids to be back in school, but the conditions that have been created are keeping a lot of families, uh, keeping their kids at home. And the other thing I would say is when people say for the mental health of kids, they must go back to school. Let's remember uh, that the, the, the COVID uh, situation has pulled back the curtain on the fact that a lot of kids were not doing well before the pandemic. And so the notion of, of having kids whose needs, whether it's issues of racism, LGBTQ bias, and a host of, and learning a dis, a disabilities that were not detected, right. there are a host of reasons why the mental health of kids going back uh, to school uh, is not in their best interest. And so everybody, you know, somebody from Sick Kids says, everybody's got to go back to school because of their mental health. Well, uh, then they haven't been in school. They haven't been looking at the nature of the diversity, the individual differences of our learners. Yes. So ideally, we want everybody to be back face-to-face -face with their peers, great educators that we have in Ontario in a safe and healthy uh, fashion. And that should be the goal. That's why we need to totally reimagine uh, how we do what we do. Uh, in our publicly funded system in Ontario. Absolutely. Um, and so we've got another question here. Um, 
more about actually mental health, as you said, yeah. how do par parents weigh the mental health benefits of having their children so back among their friends uh, and in a better learning environment versus the risk of COVID? Well, again, um, I, you know, it depends on individual circumstances. If uh, it, it, it's not just about the individual student and child, it's about the, it's about the family. It's about who's at home. The other thing that some of the so-called experts uh, have missed is the fact that um, uh, the youngest of our young, you know, are, are safe. Well, there's increasing evidence from different parts of the world that's showing that the youngest of our young may be asymptomatic carriers. So right. again, the risk is based on the family situation, who's at home and who's at risk there. Mm -hmm. All those things have to be uh, calculated. Uh, you know, in my case, um, you know, I've got five grandchildren and, uh, and you know, I've got a, a, a son-in-law who's a teacher. And uh, regarding the issue of, uh, you know, who goes back to school and who doesn't, is it individualized situation based on who the kids are and what the home uh, circumstances are. Right, absolutely. Um, and again, another related question from Cynthia. Um, she says, many high school students need sports or drama, et cetera, to keep them inspired and involved in academics. Um, as well as being able to socialize, which is so important for teenagers. All that will be gone this year. Um, and also uh, many uh, children, including her own daughter, thrive on in-person learning. They learn by seeing and doing and discussing. So how would you suggest that parents help their kids and guide them through this new reality? Well, the second, the second part of the question first. Look, uh, highly effective online learning is interactive. It's not, the, uh, it's not the transfer of information to the black box of technology and outcomes, uh, you know, lectures and do this. It's, it's highly interactive. It's got, uh, it adapts to uh, individual differences of kids and what they like. Uh, there's problem solving. There's peer group stuff that you can create uh, in chat rooms. So there's a huge amount of creative ways of having high levels of interactivity. I've been teaching at the university level for 10 years uh, in virtual ways where uh, 15 students, grad doctoral students at a time, uh, wherever they are in the world, are, are involved in a very intimate uh, peer supporting environment. Okay. Uh, so those kinds of things, I have a lot of confidence in our teachers to be able to eventually develop that. That's going to take not just a couple months, that kind of investment in doing those things creatively. Now, to the first point, boy, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an old guy, but uh, my high school years was filled with uh, uh, three sports and a lot of time out. out. It's where, it's where uh, I, I tried to, to learn how to be a leader through uh, participation in sports, right. uh, the arts, all those things are so important. But again, health and safety is first. And so I, I think the, the uh, objective is for as much of outdoor play as possible, but let's choose the outdoor play activities uh, that are basically, uh, you know, a bit, we're going to have to learn some new sports, some new activities. Uh, and uh, in terms of art and things like that, look, you can set up, you know, art situations where there's plenty of social distancing. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would not give up on that. Um, now, I know uh, there'll be a lot of teachers who, given the fact that the amount of, of uh, last minute changes to plans coming down from on high have caused a huge amount of teachers as of this moment who don't know exactly who they're teaching, if they're gonna be teaching and what the setup is. Mm -hmm. uh, thousands don't know even right now. So the notion that um, a lot of teachers will say, you know what, in terms of, of doing after school curricular stuff, I just don't know if I'm gonna have the emotional bandwidth to do that. And, and, and teachers who decide not to do that uh, should be understood in terms of empathizing with all the things that they have to do. I, I wouldn't see it as, you know, they're striking or, you know, acting out. Our teachers care about our students, uh, desperately care about our students. Um, and, and, our, and our parents know that. So on the subject of teachers, actually, we have a couple of questions regarding teachers. First of all, in terms of reopening, teachers are reportedly getting about three days of professional development. 
Um, is that enough to make them experts in handling all of these COVID-19 protocols and all of this new stuff that's happening within schools? It's enough for the basics. It's enough for hallway uh, mask on. It's enough for uh, hand washing. Uh, it's enough for monitoring out uh, during recess. But it's not enough. Again, if I was the deputy minister and I had a minister that listened to me, uh, I'm an optimistic guy, you know, and actually used to happen back in the day. Um, I would have been advising uh, my minister to make sure there was a mental health and well being plan for our teachers about two months ago. Uh, and I would be developing uh, about, uh, you know, two or three in depth workshops, first of all, on their own uh, mental health and well being. Yeah. How are they doing to deal with those things? You know, when the mask comes down, uh, you know, in the airplane, you remember we used to fly in airplanes, uh, the flight attendant would say, affix the mask to your own uh, face before helping others. Right. So the notion of teachers being resilient, helping themselves, and then they need to be trained on how to recognize what will likely happen. There will be kids who had mental health issues before the pandemic that have been exacerbated, and there'll be newly uh, there'll be new situations and teachers need to uh, to be aware of what to see when the kids come back. Mm -hmm. That child in the corner who's not interacting with anybody, the bully in the other on the other side of the continuum. And again, uh, the, the government decides we're going to have 400 uh, nurses for 4,500 schools. Uh, so they, they, they kind of go to, you know, let's see what happens and maybe we need some testing in the schools rather than the ultimate in prevention, where you would actually help have mental health and well-being experts ready to help teachers in the schools when these things arise and they will arise. No preparation for that, no resources for that, and no time to get those things right. On top of all that, uh, the minister has decided he's gonna implement a new math curriculum and a new this and a new that. And uh, I just, I don't know if anybody who's calling the shots has ever implemented anything. And number one uh, lesson we're getting implementation, and I've done a lot of it, and I've made a lot of mistakes, is you always involve those who are going to implement uh, at the front end right. in, in the process of developing the idea and how it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so we, let's move on a little bit more to uh, post-secondary and, uh, and university students. M asks, um, on the subject of post-secondary education, we've seen the plight of international students currently in Canada. Should Canada and Ontario be considering better protections and rights for them, knowing what we know now? Well, look, um, this, is a, this is a very good and complicated question, but I'll, I'll give you my version of the short answer. Look, um, uh, absolutely, we need to provide for our international students. And, and international students should not be seen by my colleagues at the post-secondary level as a cash cow. They should be seen as making the world smaller. They should be bringing uh, what they know about the, this increasingly small and, and challenging world into our classrooms. We need to internationalize what we do everywhere, including our classrooms. That said, the notion of, of having a lot of international students uh, come back from, uh, from their home countries uh, right now is slim and none. In the case of uh, the program where I work, uh, we are uh, basically going to offer very creative online interactive learning for our mm -hmm. students so that they can be where they are and participate uh, in an active, highly interactive webinar-based uh, approach to education. So we want to we want to keep as many as we can, uh, hopefully for all the right reasons. Uh, and there will be serious revenue loss for colleges and universities who have depended on uh, international students uh, to balance the books. That's going to be a challenge for uh, many of our colleges and universities. Absolutely. Uh, and then going back to younger kids now, uh, TM asks, why not make the call to only have younger kids go back to school, have high school kids learn online, uh, and use the surplus space that is left in schools um, to spread kids out better? Well, you see, this is the kind of creative thinking. Uh, these are the kinds of ideas. Uh, I don't know whether uh, she is a, a teacher or a parent or whatever, but the, the use of space, the use of resources, uh, notwithstanding the province's 
underfunding by huge magnitude of what's required for the health and safety. But that's a very interesting idea. Uh, and we don't have to think about all schools in, in every board doing the same thing. We can have one board, well, because of certain kinds of resources and because of different uh, resource uh, issue number one is space, uh, maybe you could have a variety of those kinds of situations. Having the time, consulting with the grassroots, listening to ideas like this uh, gets us closer to the kind of collaboration that's been missing uh, desperately in Ontario. Right. So we are almost out of time. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for all of your insights and answering all of our questions. Any last words for parents who are gearing up to send their kids back into the classrooms? Well, I think generally speaking, I've talked about taking notes, sharing your lived experience, uh, parents know best, uh, increasing the collaboration between parents and teachers has always been important. It's never been more important uh, than now. And I would end with the notion of the most important thing for all of us right now. And that is the uh, characteristic of empathy. Uh, things will be stressful. Things are stressful right across the board, not just in education. And the notion of understanding the pressure on teachers when things aren't perfect. The same thing with what's going on with students and teachers and employers. So if parents have to wind up staying home when they wanted to go back to work, we need employers to empathize. We need flexibility and we need to really understand in a respectful way uh, what other people, uh, what other people's pressures are uh, to be able to solve problems uh, in a more uh, focused way. Uh, because stress and anger, you can't be angry and smart at the same time. Right. Empathy is uh, the number one thing that I think we all need a little bit more of, including me. And I want to thank you, Dee. I know we had a problem with technology. Uh, right. Dee and I, we were just uh, practicing what's going to go on with online learning. And, <laughs> yeah. and we were also late because we were trying to be like the premier and his pressers, where he's always keeping us 20 minutes late. So we were just, you know, trying to emulate uh, leadership. <laughs> All part of the all part of the Zoom experience. Honestly, uh, technical difficulties are usually built into these things. Um, and like you said, this is going to happen with online learning as well. And hopefully, we can all be a little more empathetic, a little more patient as we go forward. Thanks to you and to the great questions uh, posed. Thank you so much, Doctor. Okay, we'll see you soon. Bye bye.